Hi there, I'm Justin, and I come from that big, ill-defined space in the middle of the United States that's known as the Midwest. Now, given that information, you might be making some assumptions about me right now, and I'll admit, some of them are probably even true. For instance, it's clear I enjoy casserole. <laughs> I, uh, I've been referred to as a really nice guy on many, many occasions. And once in a while, I really am um, late for work in the morning because I get caught behind a farm machine on my way in. These things really happen. But on the other side, there is a series of stereotypes about the Midwest that are uh, very, very negative. And what they do is they remind us through internet memes or jokes that people tell that the region has a long-standing tradition as being the least vibrant or the least interesting in the entire United States. You may even have heard the region referred to as flyover country, which seems to indicate this is the kind of place you're supposed to traverse as quickly as possible, preferably by airplane. That way, you never actually have to set foot on the soil or interact in any meaningful way. Well, for the last 15 or 20 years, as a poet and a photographer, it's been my job to explore this idea of the Midwest as flyover country and ask whether that's really an appropriate moniker or not. And I'll tell you what, the region has kept me both interested and it has kept me in business the entire time as an artist. I think the biggest thing that I've learned about exploring the Midwest is eventually the way that we end up seeing the world is going to come down to how we choose to look at it. So the Midwest is a region of stories. Some of them have to do with the landscape. Some of them have to do with the people. So others are flying over us, and maybe they're playing video poker on the screens built into the seats in front of them, or maybe they're enjoying their in-flight meals. Down here on the ground, life is happening every day with all of the chaos, all the controversy, all the confusion, all the comedy, all the drama, and especially all the beauty that that implies. So I try to capture some of the stories of the Midwest using poems and photographs because I want others to see what I've discovered over time, which is there really is no such place as nowhere. Everywhere is somewhere. And everywhere has a story, too, that we can uncover if we learn to use the poet or the photographer's eye. So today, I give to you the American Midwest, a story in poems. And I'll ask you to imagine for a moment that I disappear and only the poems and the photographs themselves disappear. That's where the ideas are. So we'll begin with chapter one. It's entitled, Rust, or perhaps Fine Art. Rust song. Rust, you are a heartland impressionist painter. Philosophies brailed out all across your abrasive face. You, sir, are the very color of the crater that childhood made in the middle of me a coffin suit to keep the corpse of my Midwest dressed. But you are mostly beautiful from afar. In the hard light of harder times, I expect you'd have grown less romantic as you tainted our tools and sealed our sheds beneath an imperial crust of yourself, Rust. And I imagine it would have been much harder to hum this hymn to you. Chapter 2 strong women. Rebecca, just when the drought was ending. But the best thing about Rebecca was the way she floated always beneath the scent of wood burn and dusty middle America. Her keen ranch queen convictions slicing deep and deeper into the tiniest of daily miseries with skepticism demanding always some proof before she'd concede this life he pieced together for us cell by cell with ever shakier God fingers contained even one malignancy. Every bow-legged young bull rider, every sunburnt farmer of someday who stopped by to mend a fence or just to offer genteel salutations would see her backlit by sunset and dream her into his own mother Pray to the essence of the prairie to do what the old bones could not. And it worked. She survived well enough to give of herself four more seasons among luckless kinfolk who everyone drank greedily the blood she squeezed and felt the cracked lips of the dry times less. 
As long as there was some great need into which she could empty herself, she could will the heart to continue, and none of the rules of dying applied. But she must have seen that the new rain was not baptismal nor meant for her restoration. When those storm clouds finally swelled and burst into fat miracle drum beats, she must have felt the change was coming on. Why else open the windows so wide with no thought for the evening chill? Why else cut a hundred wildflowers and arrange them into fiery clusters, but pour no water into their vases? Chapter 3, Thunderstorms. Though the coming rain announces itself by rustling the distant corn, the barns remain immutable as weathered gray monks. Without words, they pray over the dog who sleeps forever in his soil bed beside the orange relic of a horse-drawn plow. On rage the blood sugar wars, the lust for nicotine continues. The time-crumpled angels pull on their Carhartt robes and stand under wide awnings as lightning unstitches the sky. Here, every storm is 40 nights from stating the profound. Chapter 4, Until Death Do Us Part. You have been fighting at the diner to taunt her. You lean over and whisper, I'm just going to kill you with kindness. She rips into her pork chop, pauses, says, that's good to know. I'm going to kill you with a knife. <laughs> then that long moment of silence as you wait and wait and finally realize she really isn't going to laugh. <laughs> Chapter 5. The haves and the have-nots. Carrying home the feast. Hard now to recall the shame of it. The annual grocery sack stuffed near to bursting with non-perishables. Gifts from gooey-hearted room mothers, their eyes wet masses of matted mascara from the sight of your thrift store corduroys and the crooked frames of your state-bought glasses. Canned corn, cranberry sauce, box potato flakes, and pre-packaged stuffing. Here was every necessity for your 30-minute Thanksgiving feast. But any bag big enough to fill a family of four draws unwanted attention on a school bus full of high-dollar question mark jeans and sneakers with futuristic air pumps built into the tongues. Plus, it occupies the entire seat beside you, a spot where, hypothetically at least, a friend might sit. You were 11 the year you finally decided the embarrassment was too much. A first misguided act of rebellion, but how light the walk down the bus aisle and home through the streets of the trailer park that late November afternoon. Without the dreaded cargo, you'd left half leaning against the flagpole at dismissal. How quiet, too, the usual voices of ridicule who already lived like malevolent tree elves in the hollows of your adolescent mind. And how impossibly short-lived your escape. As soon as you stepped empty-handed into the wood-paneled kitchen where your mother sat smoking in her work apron, you transformed. No longer her little boy. You were just another man in the long, crooked train of cowardly men who eventually let her down. Chapter 6. Even power walking is political. Subdivision, small town Missouri, fifth day of protests. All quiet except for the growl of a lawnmower, a child squealing now and then, chirping birds gathered around backyard feeders, the smell of butchered cow burning on a charcoal grill. A father and son walk their guns, careful to obey all the pertinent leash laws. They carry plastic bags to clean up any casings dropped on neighbors' lawns. 
An officer cruises through on his daily safety patrol, waving a free hand to power walking women, pumping their May pale arms in unison. In house after house, the news goes on and right back off. The sunlight on the pavement, a bright white, so white it is almost blinding. Chapter 7, Kansas. Somewhere in Kansas, a night train torches through the dark stomach of the prairie. The man in the car on the rural route turns his head for just a moment. He wonders if he has ever made his father proud, but only a moment. Now he turns from the disembodied flames at the crossroad, he signals left. The engine hums the ballad of whatever comes after. Chapter 8, Varsity Blues, Part 1. A real team effort, otherwise known as the best poem I've ever written about a jockstrap. <laughs> and here... You'd gone and told yourself the morning couldn't possibly get any worse, not after you realized you left your jock strap swinging from your bedroom doorknob as you rushed headlong into the purple prairie morning, late again for the 6 a.m. travel bus and facing the prospect of a doubleheader behind the dish without proper protection. <laughs> and that's when you see it. Your mother's souped-up Camaro comes peeling into the high school parking lot, skids to an action movie stop in front of the bus just as the driver jerks her into drive. And now, incredibly, here is your old man sprinting in desperation, a thief or a madman. And there is something in his right hand, something which he has tucked against his side for protection, as if it were a football or perhaps an enormous jewel of untold value. There comes a pounding, and the driver cranks open the side door with impatience, and then he has your jock, which he has just received from your panting, sweat-slicked pops, and he, the driver, is holding it out away from himself as if it might be radioactive. <laughs> and now he's turning, handing it delicately to Coach, whose face goes cruel with wind sprints as he turns and passes it off to Klein the freshie, cursed to the front seats for having ears too sensitive for upperclassmen conversation. And Klein, the freshie, hands off to Castillo, the backup catcher who's gunning for your job. And Castillo, with a snicker, gives it to Rosenthal. And Rosenthal, God help him, holds the thing a second too long and lifts it toward his nose. <laughs> then Martin... Behringer, then Jonesy and Little Nick, and so it goes, every man's hands on your jock strap until it reaches that SOB loony two seats up. Looney, who could reach right out and hand it to himself, save you that final humiliation, but instead he passes it to the team manager, who is sitting in the seat directly in front of yours because she is beautiful and because you planned it that way. <laughs> now she turns, and there it is, dangling between you, frayed and a little off-white from two years of use. <laughs> Through the straps, you can see her eyes, two dark lakes where so many other sensitive boys have gone and gotten themselves thoroughly and finally drowned. You reach out to take what is yours and you wonder, is this what the old broken men think of when they stare out their windows into empty backyards, <laughs> swigging their warm beers and sighing now and then? Thank you. <laughs> Varsity Blues Part 2. <laughs> the Best Friends Lament. 29 miles from nowhere to East Nowhere, Missouri, dead of winter, wind blind, letter jacketless, rattling around the back of a drunken farm boy's pickup, nose to nose with the frozen carcass of yesterday's buck. And all because the girl at the end of this rural route has a parent empty house and the right sort of prairie sadness in her eyes. We all know the way this old ballad goes. The cast of white headlamps around the sharp country bend. 
the sheriff crunching through the hard mud rows of a frost-marbled field, everything eerie beneath the blood-red sunrise. But I swear, it would never end with a mother cradling an old baseball trophy like an infant. Not if they made me God of the Middle West. Chapter 9, The Mysteries of Barnwood. Of all things holy, Barn is holiest. Barn is crumbling red shaman. Barn is old wood, and old wood is porous and good for soaking up the blood of our confessions. Chapter 10, Flyover Country. The hospital closes, and the factory closes, and the Dollar General closes, and the youth pastor drives out at 3 a.m., and he picks up two drunk teenagers to keep them off the highways. And the neighbor brings over the surprise quilt she made for Penelope's first birthday. And the grease-stained mechanic with pearly white teeth gets an hour off work to watch her son pretend to be Ben Franklin. And she's a little late. But the teacher only smiles and says she's a hero for what she does as a single parent. And an old man plays pocket knife blues at the farmer's market. And people pray different ways by different rules. And they all seem to want the same things. And the blue stem and the goat's beard and the wheat grass turn to fry, fire on the prairie. And in the cities, you can hear nighttime laughter. The lights go on and off. There are bedtime stories and barbecues. And two people spot each other across a crowded room, just like in a song. And the leaves rust. And the surgeons make triple bogeys between miracles. And some of them shoot deer and read biographies of Keats and Shelley in the quiet of the deer blind. And Rose wakes to aching bones this first winter without her husband, and finds the snow has already been gone from her sidewalk and driveway. And the airplane engines hum. And people pass over this place where nothing ever happens, with palm trees and sand on the backs of their eyelids, so glad to have booked a direct flight. Thank you.